Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Thomas Honig. Tom was vice chair of the FDIC from 2012 to 2018, and the 20 years prior to that, he was president of the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank. Tom is currently a distinguished senior fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and a colleague of mine. Tom focuses on the long-term impact of the politicization of financial services, as well as the effects of government-granted privileges and market performance. Tom joins us today to talk about COVID-19, the Fed's response to it, and the current state of banking in the United States. Tom, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be back. I look forward to the conversation. Well, it's great to have you as a colleague. I feel very privileged to have you as a colleague. Now, we both commute to Arlington, so we're not always there at the same time, but it's great when we are because I can walk down the hall and there's Tom Honig with his door open, former president of the Kansas City Fed, former FDIC vice chair, and he's willing to entertain David Beckworth and his crazy ideas. I love it. (laughs) So I got you. I can go badger you with some of my my notions and Scott Summers, my other colleague. So it's been a great place to work to have people like you around. I just feel real privileged that you're a part of Mercatus. It's a privilege for me to work with uh, with Mercatus and with you in particular. I've had a I've had a good time. Well, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun for sure. Now, before we get into the meat of our discussion today, I'm just curious: what has the crisis meant for you in your personal life? Have you been locked down in Kansas City? I have been locked down since um, early March, and uh, it is the, here like it is in most places. Uh, a lot of the malls are closed and uh, Restaurants are closed uh, just now in Kansas City area, beginning to open up a little bit, but very slowly as there are still a lot of cases out there, uh, although declining, and we keep our fingers crossed, but we'll see how this how this evolves. Okay. And I imagine you're well set up. You've got an office at home there. You can work. You're finding it that you're able to be productive at home as well as in the office. I, I hope so. I, I think so. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I. It's been great, though, to uh, be in a position where we can still work. I know many people aren't as fortunate as us. Yes. Um, so we have great jobs, and we're able to continue work. In fact, you know, I would say the we are striking while the iron is hot. <laughs> this is an opportune time for people like you, Tom, to weigh in and, and give us wisdom on what should be done with policy. So let's, let's segue into that. And as a way to think about it with you, you have this really amazing career, storied career. So... You started at the Kansas City Fed in the early 70s. In fact, from 1973 to 91, you were doing bank supervision. And as we talked about on the last show, you overlapped with Don Cohn, who became a governor, vice vice chair, I believe, of the Board of Governors. So you guys overlapped there. And then in 91 and 2011, you were the president. Is that right? That is that is correct. For 20 years. 20 years of the Kansas City Fed. And, and part of that, I mean, you had a lot of responsibility and I encourage our listeners to go back and listen to that show. You go through some of what you did. It's more than just doing monetary policy and, and bank regulation. It was managing an organization. And sometimes you had to make you know, tough decisions like all CEOs have to. And that's really fascinating to hear that side of the job. After that, you became the vice chair of the FDIC from 2012 to 2018, where you helped implement Dodd-Frank, and you really worked hard to get banks to fund with more capital. I know they never got to the point where you wanted them to be, but uh, you worked hard, and that was your goal. And And I'm wondering, you know, coming into this crisis, how did you feel about banks? Were banks better prepared? I mean, was there any progress made coming into this crisis so that banks could better withstand a shock like COVID-19? I think the banks, especially some of the larger banks, uh, found themselves as a result of the of the efforts of um, the regulatory authorities and themselves, and I think their own boards, having had a very bad experience in two thousand eight and nine, that they did improve their capital positions. Uh, as uh, I've said before, not as much as I would have liked, but better than perhaps they would have liked, or more than they would have liked. And so they did come into this. Um, a little better prepared for the shock and and the still the the stress that is ahead of them because we're 
in this quarter really taking the real hits that are coming with the shrinkage of the economy and how they fare through this quarter, uh, I think will be very telling as in terms of the outlook for the future and how well prepared they are to help rebuild that future. So is there a small chance that many of these big banks, while they're solvent now, might become insolvent if this drags on long enough? Well, anything that drags on long enough can can threaten solvency. I'm of the view at the moment that given all the support that has come from both the the government in terms of fiscal policy and the Fed in terms of liquidity and support policies, lending policies, that the economy will begin to turn uh, in the third quarter and build from there and therefore allow the banks to, number one, absorb the losses that are almost certainly there, uh, but then to turn forward and begin to uh, help in the recovery. So I don't expect major insolvencies uh, because I think the economy will turn in the third quarter, but they are going to feel pressure. And I hope and expect at the moment that they are better prepared to deal with that pressure now than they were in 2008-9. Okay, that's great to hear. And one of the critiques that you often hear about these big banks right now during the crisis is the, the dividends they're making and sometimes also share buybacks. But is there a, an urgency for banks to quit doing dividends during this time? You know, I think, is it Neil Kashkari who called for banks, president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, called for them to increase their, their capital cushion, and this is one way they could do that. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think that, no, well, first of all, I would acknowledge that some of them, the larger, have ceased uh, buying back their own stock, and that helps okay. serve capital, and that's a plus. Uh, that does leave dividends, though, and it does leave some of the elements in terms of the uh, executive management's uh, bonus programs. But I, and I would say that, you know, they are part of the judge, but I would encourage them to delay dividends or cease dividends temporarily. And there are some benefits. People say it's not enough to make a difference, but I think perhaps it is enough to matter. My, I personally think that. And, and I've got a, two or three reasons for that. Number one, they do have to absorb some losses. And the better capitalized you are, the better able you are to absorb those losses without causing people to become anxious, that is the stockholders and the public more generally. So it strengthens your balance sheet. Number two, because you are better capitalized, you're able to work with your borrowers more liberally. That is to give the borrower more time to see the recovery come and to help provide concessions to them to get through this. And that really is, I think, an important dimension for the banks to have in mind as they proceed through this crisis period. And finally, um, I do expect we will see a, a recovery start in the third quarter and beyond. And uh, having a stronger capital base actually provides a better base for lending. Because remember, for every dollar of capital they retain, there's approximately $15 of loans that they can make. So your leverage off of that, given the capital requirements and their capital level, can be quite helpful to the economy, to businesses, and to the recovery. So I would encourage them to at least consider it very seriously uh, as they as they see this quarter evolve. That's a great point. I hadn't thought of that. So the bigger their capital cushion going into the recovery, the better position they are to extend loans um, moving forward. And that's what we need to get the economy up and running again. And, and you know, a actually following the last crisis of 2008-9, the banks that were better capitalized were able to support the lending programs uh, more readily than the banks that were on the margin. And you would expect that, and it proved to be the case. And so here we have another opportunity to maybe make a difference by having a better capital base. Interesting, very interesting. So just to maybe recap on some of the numbers, coming into this crisis, and I know averaging across very different types of banks is, is a crude approximation, 
But how much capital did banks fund with? I mean, what what was the percent? Was it five percent? How how big did it get on average? Well, the thing you have to remember is there's uh, various ways to measure capital, and most of the banks use a tier one so-called tier one capital ratio, which takes their equity to their risk-weighted capital, okay. uh, the risk-weighted assets rather. And that gives you a, a, a number of anywhere from 10 to 12% or higher. Uh, but that I think is misleading because it takes a lot of their balance sheet and says, oh, now this is a lower risk and so you don't have to hold capital against it. So if you kind of um, normalize that and look at the leverage ratio, that is the tangible capital that that is that amount of capital that can absorb loss against their total assets. Uh, the average is around six and a half percent, maybe between six and a half and seven percent. Okay, that's for the largest banks. For the regional and smaller banks, it's between eight and ten percent. During the last crisis in two thousand eight, those numbers were probably closer to three and a half percent for the largest banks. So you can see. They are better capitalized, but still the largest are less well capitalized than the regionals and the smaller banks, but it's still an improvement. It is. Now, where would you place that number in an ideal world? If you could wave a magic wand, (laughs) you were the capital dictator of America. Where would you put those numbers? I would have those numbers for the largest banks be uh, at a minimum of 10%. Before, and I say that for a couple of reasons. Number one, before you had all the safety nets in place, uh, the markets and the banks themselves understood that to have between 10 and 15% was really where they wanted to be and should be. And we also found in some of the research, even some of the research more recently that the Mercatus folks have done, that 15% gives you a, a much greater staying power for a very serious downturn. My number of 10% is kind of a compromise number in a sense, but it is, I think, a level that would give them pretty good staying power through any crisis and then help rebuild for the recovery. Okay, so banks are in a much better position. Unfortunately, we're not experiencing the same type of crisis as we did in 2008, which lasted longer than we think this crisis will last and also had these long-lasting effects we had the slow recovery, and 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 some would argue hysteresis. We never we, it took time for markets to heal, and hopefully, this is very deep and very sharp. And hopefully, as you mentioned, we can have a, a rebound start soon. Although I'm sure there's going to be some small businesses that never come back, some some relationships that are destroyed that will never recover. But hopefully, we'll have something some kind of robust recovery here in the third quarter, fourth quarter of this year. And uh, we can get things going again. And ultimately, banks will be um, able to do what they, they're meant to do, financial intermediation in our economy. I hope so as well. And it depends a lot on how quickly the virus can be brought under control and how much confidence people have yep. with uh, restarting their lives. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anyone does. Uh, so we are kind of in limbo as far as that issue is concerned. But I think most people assume that we are going to begin to uh, re-engage with the economy in this third quarter. Yeah. And we see different states, different localities opening up different uh, stages. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Like the state of Georgia, where I'm from originally, opened up pretty early. And uh, it'll be interesting to follow and see what happens there. Because I, I do think you're right, even as these states open up, one of the concerns will be people themselves, not the governments, but people. Will they be more risk averse? You know, will they be willing to go out and engage in commerce, to trade, to travel, to spend, uh, to live life normally if they're still nervous about the virus? So it's more than just governments giving the green light. It's about us engaging as consumers and businesses. Okay, well, let's move on to what the Fed has done for the economy so we've, we've touched a little bit, I guess, in terms of what it's, it's doing for banks. But let's let's really dig in deep here and, and talk about the Fed's response to the crisis, because you are a former member of the FOMC. So you have a great perspective on this. You you saw this from the inside in 2008, 2009. I mean, you have a f- 
really a great perspective to bear on this, as well as from someone who regulated banks at the FDIC. So I'm going to categorize what the Fed has done into three areas or three buckets. All right. So the first one's going to be the Fed's response to the crisis, traditional, what I call traditional monetary policy. The second one I would call liquidity response or liquidity facilities, trying to make sure the banking system and, and the what some would call the shadow banking system is is still standing and, and able to do their job. And finally, credit facilities, kind of the, the new area the Fed has gone into this time around, trying to prop up the real economy with these really novel and new um, lending facilities. So let's work our way through those three different buckets and just kind of get your feedback, your perspective on them as we do so. So let's start with traditional monetary policy. So what we've seen the Fed do there is it's it's lowered rates to zero or zero to 0.25, but basically we got to the zero lower bound. And according to Chair Powell, and he speaks on behalf of the FOMC, no one there wants to go negative. So we've, we've reached the lower bound for interest rates, number one. Number two, they have gone on unlimited QE. So QE is, you know, they, they will buy as much as they need, I guess, to, to get to where they're going. Uh, one thing that's not been very clear is where they're going in terms of what's the end goal of the QE purchases. And I think it'd be nice to tie that to something. Maybe maybe their end goal is hitting 2% inflation, some measure of full employment. But they've done that. And of course, they've, they've promoted you know, forward guidance by sending out signals. They'll be doing this as long as they need to. But I, I would guess if I had to summarize, it would be rates cut to zero, unlimited QE. They haven't you know, opted for negative rates. They haven't really opted for yield curve control yet or any other, or helicopter drops or anything else really radical. They've stuck with their traditional tool set. I, I say traditional, traditional since 2008, QE and interest rates. So I'm just wondering, have they done what's appropriate in your view in terms of traditional monetary policy? I think they have done what is impro- appropriate given the circumstances themselves in and the economies in. I don't think any chairman could given the precedent that had already been set and the needs of the economy would have done anything differently than this FOMC has done. Certainly I would have been in agreement with it because what you're doing is you're not just supporting the so-called shadow market uh, at all. You're, you're trying to provide uh, confidence that there is always going to be enough liquidity to allow uh, markets to function. Whether those markets were um, too far extended, whether they were less cautious than they should have been, for the moment, that is not the issue. The issue is we are where we are, and how do you make sure there's enough liquidity to assure confidence uh, in the economy so that it doesn't collapse uh, upon itself? And so going to zero was uh, probably a very easy call. Uh, expanding and reintroducing QE was probably a very easy call. Extending it then further, that is the ability to create money to a broader set of uses, including direct lending, that may have been a more difficult call, but given the circumstances and the fact that this was an outside event a virus, uh, I think they were able to uh, get over that hurdle and Uh, do all that they felt, that is the committee felt, uh, was necessary to provide uh, confidence in the economy and prevent it from from collapsing. So I think those are, you know, not easy choices in some sense, but in another sense, they are very rational choices. So they have been very aggressive with the traditional part of, of monetary policy, and you're supportive of what they've done. Um, I know going into this, though, you had some reservations on what they were doing with like the repo market, um, but they stepped in. And so, for example, in March, and maybe this is where we move into our discussion of the liquidity facilities bucket. So let's leave traditional monetary policy and talk about what they're doing in terms of supporting the financial system, which I, I think most observers would agree that it, it, it fits the definition of, of some kind of lender of last resort or I think um, Perry Merlin calls it a market maker of last resort. But they've been massively intervening in the shadow banking system, 
starting with the repo operations. So they've, you know, they're investing over a trillion dollars in overnight repo, another trillion in one month to three months out. They've also, as you know, have reopened up some of the facilities they used in 2008, including the primary dealer credit facility, the money market funds liquidity facility, the commercial paper facilities. All of those are to keep this this measure, this institutional form of money, you know, rolling over, keeping it alive and well, so that liquidity in the financial system is still functioning. And my understanding is the the changes they made to Dodd Frank under thirteen three coming out of the last crisis really, you know, specifies that they can only set up facilities to that end. That they ha- when they do these facilities, they have to be directed to providing liquidity to the financial system. And so you can argue. That, Make a reasonable argument that's what they've done with these facilities. It does beg the question, though, is is there a better way to deal with all of this activity that's outside the traditional banking system? So, in other words, the Fed can reach traditional banking needs through the discount window and its facilities that it was designed. But the shadow banking system, so all this institutional money assets, the repos, commercial paper, all of that is kind of outside the normal channels through which the Fed operates. So it has to set up these special facilities and I'm just wondering if you think there's a way to better manage that or have a, a full-time facility set up to, to deal with them or just rewrite regulation. I mean, I, I guess this kind of goes back to our discussion of, of banking. There is a lot of money creation occurring outside of banks. And do you have any thoughts on how we, you know, as a country should approach it, should, should engage with it, should regulate it? Well, th- those are, that's a pretty yeah, that's a huge question. I know it's. <laughs> uh, but let me start by kind of a technical element, and that's the 13.3. Dodd Frank changed it, but not really. They have to go to the Treasury to get permission to engage in this. And, you know, the, the Secretary of Treasury is a political appointee. It's highly uh, unlikely that the tr- Secretary of Treasury would ever say no to the Fed on that request. So it's, it's more formality than substance there. So that's that's not an issue for me. I know it is for some, but not for me. The second is what we've done over time, that is what the Fed has done over time is enable the financial system to lever up to ever greater degrees uh, because it has maintained low interest rates for an extended period of time starting uh, bef- before the last crisis uh, around following the recession of 2000 and moving forward. So you've, you've encouraged this leverage and you've encouraged the use of short-term funds to, to fund longer-term assets among groups other than just commercial banks. So that's, that's done. That's money market mutual funds um, and other institutions. And so I think you've set, you've set that up. I mean, that's it now. And so when you get a crisis, normally when you weren't so leveraged, these uh, so-called shadow banks would have lines of credit with commercial banks uh, who had then a line to the Fed and you would address these liquidity issues through the banking system. And the banking system is not equipped to do that any longer. It's more leveraged itself, number one. And number two, these others have become so large through the leveraging process, helped with low interest rates, even in non-crisis times that you have a different set of circumstances. And I would expect the Fed would continue to provide backup uh, to money market mutual funds, asset-backed commercial papers, should there be liquidity crisis in the future. I think it's very difficult to back away from, which leads me to your kind of what you introduced with, and that is the repo market and some of my objections to what went on last fall But that was not a crisis period. That was a period in which you were trying to transition from this very extensive balance sheet that they had, this very extensive use of QE in the past, to begin to normalize it. And as soon as there was a hiccup in the market, um, the Fed uh, backed away. And that's because you had to fund the federal government's debt without allowing interest rates to rise. So if you are going to peg interest rates at very low levels and the government is going to continue to print money and you're going to expect the primary dealers to purchase that government securities and redistribute it, you're going to have the 
the Fed uh, having to intervene even in uh, non-crisis periods. And that's a, a, a very, in my view, um, a very unfortunate set of circumstances for the central bank to find itself in. But in the immediate period, the period of crisis, that's when the central bank does have a mandate and a responsibility to intervene to uh, mitigate the effects of the crisis on the larger economy. And that's what they've done and what they have to do, not just to banks, but to uh, other institutions in the market that are bank-like with their mismatch of assets and liabilities. Yeah. And I appreciate your pragmatism. I mean, you're very thoughtful on that, that, hey, we're in a crisis. Let's respond to it because it is a crisis. In normal times, let's think through our options more carefully. I guess my question is, in normal times, should we be rethinking, you know, how the system overall works in terms of money creation? So, you know, the money market funds, the repo markets, I mean, they're effectively creating money assets, you know, this maturity mismatch that you've, you've talked about, it's effectively creating liabilities on certain financial firm balance sheets that act as money, you know, for, for big institutional investors. And they're not in the traditional banking system. So these liabilities, they can be run on just like traditional, you know, bank liabilities can be run on, except traditional banks have FDIC, they're regulated, where these shadow banks aren't so much. And there's been some radical calls, and I'm not comfortable with them, but I'll just mention one out, throw some out, for example. Some want to you know, regulate and, and, and dictate that any kind of money creation has to occur within a regulated bank. So somehow you would outlaw all shadow market money creation or you know, short-term liabilities. I'm not sure how that would work, if it was even possible, but there's some smart people who've been advocating that. But I wonder if there's any other kind of market-friendly way to, to approach this, because the concern is that more and more of what we call money, money-like assets, are occurring on balance sheets of, of firms outside the banking system, as you note, and they can create a financial crisis in the future because these are liabilities that can be run on. So what can we do in a market-friendly way to deal with that growth? Well, that growth is enabled, in my opinion only, by the fact that we have accepted and we uh, encourage leverage in our economy. We are a much more leveraged economy today than we were even 50 years ago. And we are committed to that. Even, even when we entered this crisis, prior to entering this crisis, our debt, uh, even private debt, was higher uh, in 2019 than it was in, in 2007. And we've added to that even greater amounts of public debt because our debt, federal debt outstanding, uh, was in around 2010 around, or 2008, around $9 trillion. And by 2019, it was over $20 trillion. And today, it's over $24 trillion. You create the environment and the incentives to lever up. So now... These shadow banks are often funded by the commercial banks, uh, whether they're a hedge fund, the exception is money market mutual funds, perhaps, but they are like banks, uh, and we've allowed that to occur, and we've allowed that uh, through this leveraging process. So that's very important. And the other element of it is we no longer have any external check. There's, there's no rule. Or there's no standard uh, for the creation of money. So it's strictly whatever the Fed and the powers that be would like to see uh, extended that will be extended. And that in and of itself, I think, is creates the environment for even more leverage in the future. And remember, the only everyone who is not uh, the central bank wants more money. I mean, it doesn't matter who it is. If, if you're uh, a liberal in Congress, you want more money. If you're a business, you want more money. So the incentives are to uh, try and create, the, 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 the incentives are to try and get the central bank to create more money so you can have more money, you can leverage more uh, until it becomes its own problem. So 
the, the I think a better solution than than saying only money can be created within the within the regulated bank, which I think you would have a very difficult time policing. It would yep. make you a, a, even more of a state police uh, rather than a central bank. Is to um, address over time in a systematic fashion the excessive leverage that we're carrying, and that is that requires a very strong independent central bank, and uh, and to avoid uh, a future Volcker moment where we where we find ourselves in crisis from having too much money printed. No, I'm very sympathetic to that. I agree. It, it's, in my mind, it'd be very difficult to police that. Even if you could, say, in the first instance, police it, you know there'd be a new shadow banking system emerge somewhere else. <laughs> so it, it just seems to me to be a very Herculean task to, to limit money creation to the commercial banking system. I mean, Think of the euro dollars, for example. They're overseas, right? There's money creation outside the U.S. And it's not clear how you could all contain that. So I, I think you're, I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. I think you're right. It, it's all about funding with more capital, less leverage. So it's a long journey is what you're telling us. It's, there's no quick fix. It's just a journey back toward. It, it, and that's correct. It's a long journey. It's been a long journey to get here. So it's yeah, not going to be a short trip uh, if you want to avoid uh, economic chaos. <laughs> get back, but it right. also requires a very systematic uh, commitment to a slow, difficult deleveraging process over time. And and just as a footnote, I think that's what last September was all about. Uh, as you tried to move to the deleveraging, you you got people very nervous and very unhappy, and therefore you found yourself having to backtrack and uh, start growing your balance. That is, the Fed had to backtrack and start growing its balance sheet again uh, related to the repo market. Unfortunate, uh, I think. Yeah, for sure. Well, for those of us who like a corridor operating system, a, a thoughtful one, not one that, I mean, I think you could argue the the Fed accidentally tripped into a corridor system of all the, all the developments last year. But to get to a corridor system, you have to make that balance sheet lean and I, I, I really wonder, you know, <laughs> will we ever see that at all again? I mean, I, I don't want to be pessimistic here. I mean, at some point in the future, we could. It'll be a long journey, as you say, but the Fed's balance sheet is going to be really large after this crisis. So to, to pare it back down to something that would be consistent with an, a corridor operating system. I, I think it's going to, I mean, I don't envy the Fed or anyone. I, I, what I worry about is that it will be, it's going to be highly, highly difficult, right? Because everyone wants more money. The government will want more money. It's going yeah. to have huge debt to fund. The businesses want more money. If if you don't do it, then interest rates go up and everyone starts to uh, beat on the Fed. Uh, so it's going to take a lot of effort. And that's why I say, you know, starting with the, the government itself has to commit to grow its debt less quickly than the GDP grows. That's number one. And then the Fed has to say, all right, we're going to let our balance sheet come down. And for you guys who are speculating in the repo market, you're on your own. Then you might be over time without bringing the economy into uh, a recession. You might be able to uh, see some reasonable deleveraging. I don't mean to eliminate leverage. It's very important. But to make crises less uh, traumatic by having less leverage to try and cope with. Otherwise, our balance sheet, the Fed's balance sheet will, next crisis, go from, uh, I don't know where to go this time, let's say it goes to eight to nine trillion, next time it'll be 15 trillion. And uh, I don't know where that ends except badly. No, I agree with you. We actually did a show with George Selgin on his book called Fiscal QE. It's a new book he has out and actually it it got, uh, you know, outdated pretty quickly by what was happening with this crisis. So that's actually one of the shows we have uh, sitting in the hopper we never did release because you know events passed it by pretty quickly. But the point of his book, which is a really good one, is that the floor operating system, what the Fed currently has, where you separate the size of the Fed's balance sheet from the stance of monetary policy, opens it up to this very thing you're talking about, that if the public, if Congress sees that, hey, the Fed can buy up, it can intervene in all these markets without any effect on the stance of policy, without changing interest rates, 
well, let's try all kinds of new programs. And you're right. If we can go up to you know eight, nine, ten trillion dollar balance sheet with no effect on inflation and still have low rates, it's going to be a very attractive piggy bank for other folks to want to raid. Which you know speaks to the point we're going to get to a little bit more later, and that's the politicization of the Federal Reserve and the lack of independence. Let me say one thing on on. Go ahead. That yes. is, as you, it seems like such a uh, an easy thing to do, but if you look, go back and look at the period following the last crisis, and you look at it compared to the period following the recession of in the early 90s, the growth rate, this, with all the stimulus that was put in there after 2010, the growth rate of the GDP was almost half of what it was in the earlier period. Productivity was almost half of what it was in the earlier period. So what you do is you, you, have, this, you have this sense of, of uh, progress, but when you get down to it, it's it's not progress at all. And at some point, it it becomes counterproductive, uh, and then it becomes very, very troubling to the ability of your economy to continue to grow and provide in, uh, an increase in wealth to the broadest base of your population rather than what you had hoped for. So I just I have to say that because of it, it has such strong implications for the future. No, absolutely. And I, I think one of the big takeaways is we're going to be disappointed in what the Fed can actually do in terms of growth. And I think we're going to be disappointed in terms of what the Fed can do in with these new programs, as I've discussed with several of our previous guests. So let's use that as a way to segue into the next bucket. So we've, we've covered Fed's traditional monetary policy. We've covered the Fed's liquidity facilities. And those two first buckets, I think everyone is fairly comfortable with. Um, you can argue on the margins and maybe like me, you might want a level target added. Our previous guest was Scott Sumner and he wanted to see the Fed do more with traditional monetary policy. But I think in general, most people would understand at least what the Fed has done in this crisis with those first two buckets. It's this third bucket that's really controversial and, and also at the same time understandable given that Congress isn't eager to do a whole lot and wants to kind of pass the buck on to the Fed. And what I'm thinking of here are the credit facilities, and this is where the Fed is lending to the real economy, as opposed to doing traditional monetary policy or supporting liquidity in the financial system. So I think we all know what I'm talking about here, but just to be precise, the primary and secondary market corporate facilities, the municipal liquidity facility, Main Street facilities, there's three versions, the PPP loan facilities. So the Fed is intervening in you know corporate credit markets and state and local government financing and small and medium-sized business financing as well. And this is intervening into the real economy. We've had a lot of guests talk about some of the challenges they see in this, but I'm wondering, what challenges do you see in it? I mean, you're a former FOMC member. What concerns do you see in it? Or maybe do you see a certain good to it? I mean, where do you stand on these facilities? Well, I first of all, I would say I understand, I think, I understand what the... FOMC is thinking about, and that is you're trying to make this more democratic. You're trying to get it out to a broader base uh, in terms of the real economy. Um, some Now, some of the bond market stuff, uh, the primary and secondary, uh, that would be controversial on its own since those are usually larger corporations. So that's why this direct lending facility uh, has been, uh, I think, introduced to make it more democratic so that you have uh, the smaller businesses or intermediate businesses receiving some of this. Um, I, so I understand it. Um, I do think that that is the role of the commercial banking industry, including the largest, rather than the Fed's role. Uh, and it's disappointing to me that they're unable or unwilling to fill that role and that the Fed is so willing to step into that role um, because you are setting, again, a new precedent, uh, mostly new. Uh, there's a very small amount of lending in the Great Depression, I realize, but mostly new. And yep. it does introduce uh, another element of, oh, this is convenient. Uh, we're going to have you lend in the future, maybe not for an immediate crisis, but because we feel there's a need for it. And you will see that pressure, um, I think, coming from Congress depending on who, who is speaking, 
uh, and from the general populace more uh, in terms of their wish for access to broader base of credit. So you are introducing, I think, some real risk into the Fed's um, independence in the future. Yeah, I agree with you completely on that. And I think the Fed has to be aware of that as well. I suspect, you know, the reason the Fed is is doing these is, like you said, because it wants to try to be fair, but also expediency. You know, that it, it's it's an institution that has technocrats that everyone seems to trust maybe more than other institutions. But it also, I, I think, in part is because Congress is, again, passing the buck. The, the Congress is pushing... I think responsibilities it should be doing onto the Fed. It's it's an off one. It's an off balance sheet way of doing, you know, activities. It's an off balance sheet way of, of providing relief activity, so the price tag looks smaller. Number one, but also it's a way to avoid some of the political gridlock Congress might face and having to to wrestle with it itself. But anytime you're dealing with the real economy, and you're making decisions, and some groups may be better off, some might be harmed. It clearly becomes a, a question which Congress should be considering, and I, I think you know, like you said, it's, it's going to politicize the Fed more and potentially harm its independence in the future. And some of my previous guests have have um, pointed out the Fed is also not well equipped to, to do this kind of lending. It, you know, as you mentioned, the Fed is probably going to be better equipped to deal with the big corporations because they got securities, they're rated. The Fed has to deal. The Fed cannot do grants, and the Fed has to deal with firms that are solvent. So, right there, it, it kind of really makes it hard to reach into certain places. So, I, I do think we're going to be disappointed on many levels with what the Fed is doing with the smaller businesses, and, and it's going to create some political backlash. I think I agree. first of all, I do agree with you. I believe that this is a congressional Congress government responsibility. Uh, it is a fiscal policy action um, that is out there. Um, and it, it, it is unfortunate that you have such a divide in the Congress and in the government that you cannot uh, get this done as close to right as possible uh, for uh, everyone's sake. And then uh, it is unfortunate that the the Fed feels this obligation. I can understand it completely, because once you once you walk into this, um, getting out is um, it's a little more like quicksand than you might otherwise like. Um, so we'll have to see how they do. I think it means their balance sheet will grow um, more, uh, which. Uh, in the future will make it even more difficult to, shall we say, normalize policy uh, or deleverage the economy. Um, only time will tell. Yes, and to his credit, Jay Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, these past few weeks has been very adamant about Congress doing more. He's really been pushing on Congress to do more heavy lifting. And I, I think, you know, maybe they recognize that there are limits to what they can do with the Fed. I mean, the Fed can expand its balance sheet as big as it wants to, but there are just real limits by law what the Fed can do. Now, Tom, I'm wondering if if you've seen any kind of, I don't know, um, perception out there in Kansas. Have you seen businesses that feel like they're not being treated fairly or that the programs aren't well designed for them? I know you have lots of contacts from your time there. What is? Do you have any sense of what's going on on the ground level there in the Midwest in terms of whether these programs are working and how they're being perceived by the public? I think generally they are perceived pretty well. I mean, like so many things, it, the programs got off to a little bit of a bumpy start, but there's been a real effort. I've noticed by the legislative um, individuals, that is the senator. Uh, senators and some of the congressmen in um, getting this out and explained. Uh, there's been good, shall we say, help from some of the media, especially the business journals, in explaining how to do this, how to apply, how to get it, how to work with it. Um, that has made this go more smoothly here than what uh, some people might have expected. Um, is it perfect? Hardly. 
but it is, it's been, I think, mostly received now as having been done pretty uh, equitably uh, across the board with a few exceptions. So I'm, I'm pleased with that, uh, to be honest. Well, that's great to hear, which that would imply less, you know, political blowback from constituents and um, a better you know, standing for the Fed going forward. Although for the reasons we've talked about before, there still might be some concerns about the Fed's independence in the future. So any parting thoughts here on concerns you have about the Fed's independence moving forward, the ability for it to do traditional monetary policy because of all these new areas it's getting into? On a couple levels. Number one, during the crisis, there's no issue of independence because everyone wants the same thing or thinking the same yeah. way. So as you move away from it, I think the Fed will be pretty successful on stopping the programs, that is not growing them any further uh, and seeing them unwind, but where they will, I think, be challenged, uh, extremely challenged, will be on unwinding the uh, of the balance sheet effects of the program, the uh, ability to say no to funding all new government debt that comes out to keep interest rates uh, artificially low. That's when the independence of the Fed will be most important, and that's when the independence of the Fed will be most challenged. Um, and I, I, I wish them all the best because they're going to need a lot of help to stay to stay independent and to run policy in the best long run interest of the country, not just the immediate, uh, I want part of, of the recovery. Yep. And I actually think Jay Powell is probably well suited for that role. He's very pragmatic. He's also, I think, very smart political operator. I remember there's an article that talked about him a few years ago, wearing out the carpet in Capitol Hill. He's visited so many times. And he's I think, just, I think he is very well equipped. Uh, I, I, I admire him. Number one, he's very articulate. Uh, he's, he doesn't dance around with words as much as you would see some politicians, perhaps. And he's um, very calm. And I think people have confidence in him, which is uh, extremely important, especially on the backside of this. So I, I do, I agree with you. I think he's a very good person to have in this role uh, going forward. Absolutely. We are fortunate to have a leader like him at the Fed during this time. Okay, so going forward, we've touched on these three buckets. Going forward, I'm thinking of some of the developments that might be on the horizon for the Fed. So let's put aside, you know, the independence concerns, but let's talk about some of the tools the Fed might still employ. So I hope you are right that we will see a strong recovery third and fourth quarter, so we won't be needing all these additional tools. But let's think of a you know maybe a, a worst case scenario or at least a scenario where things don't get well quickly. Do you foresee the Fed doing things like negative interest rates or yield curve control? I well, first of all, uh, on yield curve control, that is a possibility. It's an effort that will affect asset prices, which is I think something they'll uh, could have on their mind if things don't go well. And so I could see that happening. I think they are wisely uh, staying away from negative interest rates and should stay away from negative interest rates. And I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, it is a very distortive in terms of the allocation of resources. And number two, those who have tried it have been sorely disappointed and find themselves in holes that they are unable to dig their way out of, and that includes Japan and Europe. I see. I do not envy either one of them for their uh, economies or their management of the economy during and after the crisis. So I don't see any need to follow their example uh, relative to negative interest rates and the harm that it will do to uh, our economy, just as it has done to their economies. Okay. So one other development that may be on the horizon is the Fed's big review of its policy. So we started last year, the year before, the strategic review of how it does monetary policy, communication tools, the whole thing. But the big emphasis has been on what the Fed targets or how it targets. 
And effectively, there's been this discussion about moving from an inflation target, which you could call more precisely a growth rate target, to something closer to a level target where you make up for past misses. Either you, both ways, to be clear. So if you're, you know, if you're below target, you've got to grow faster the next few periods to get back up to your trend target or path. And if you were above it, you got to come down. So that was at least talked about before this crisis emerged, and it was being manifested in this idea of an average inflation target. Of course, I would like to see a nominal GDP level target for many reasons. And I, I do think that a level target would make a big difference in, in the flexibility the Fed has in, in dealing with this crisis and, and supporting a recovery. My concern is if they don't have a level target, they're going to dial back policy prematurely. But let's just take that as given. You may not agree with that, but I, I'm a big fan of level targeting. My question is, if you're on the FOMC, so you know you were on the FOMC, but if you're on the FOMC right now and you have all these other things going on, I mean, Jay Powell's plate is so full right now, he probably can't see past it, along with the other members, you know, Rich Clarita and other members of the FOMC. Do you think they have time or they're thinking about the review and do you think it's something that they're going to want to pass this year or to, or to finalize this year, given everything else that's going on? Well, I, I do think that taking a review and look at it is, is, is a wise choice that they made. And, and I agree with you. Uh, I'm not a fan of inflation targeting. I uh, never was because there's so many other factors uh, that you have to take into account in, in an FOMC meeting. I, I think it's by itself a bad target, whether nominal GDP or others, I think deserve a review. Now, in terms of as a result of this crisis, I doubt that there, I doubt, I don't know, but I doubt that this is on anyone's um, immediate agenda. And I don't think we'll have much of substance this year. And if we do, I will be, I'm not sure I would want that because it, it, it would be rushed in my opinion. I think so they need to, once they get through this, look at where they are and it's going to be even more difficult uh, because they are going to have a balance sheet that's probably twice as large as it was when it started. They yeah. will also have even more pressure for what they target relative to uh, current uh, interest rate levels uh, and not just inflation targets. And so they need to probably almost have to start over. And um, I'm not sure that's a bad thing given the crisis and what we're coming through and what the future holds uh, and what, they go, what they're going to face. Yeah, that's my suspicion as well. I mean, they've just got so many things going on. Although, again, I think it I think if they had a level target coming into this crisis, it would have been a, a big help for them, whether it's a price level target or a nominal GDP level target. I mean, I just think level targeting makes a big difference, but I, I suspect you're pro you are probably right, but maybe we'll be surprised. The original deadline was June of this year, which is coming up on us pretty quickly. So uh, if anyone over there in the Eccles buildings is listening, please uh, let us know. Can we expect a a surprise birthday gift this summer or not. So um, there's many, I know there's many fans out there of the show who are also big supporters of level targeting and we're waiting with uh, bated you know, breath. And, and to be honest, David, I think, you know, right now we're in a crisis. So people are worried about deflation. Yeah. Uh, at another time, they might say nine months from now, depending on what happens to supply versus demand, they could have an inflationary concern. I think they need to let things settle through and judge what is the best way to map a course forward. And it, and I don't think they can do that by June because I don't think they're going to have enough experience with this immediate crisis and they won't know where we are in the recovery for sure. And so why rush it? Let's manage the crisis and get ourselves back. And I don't mean back to uh, 4% unemployment. I mean back to where employment is declining systematically again and then think carefully about the path forward. Yeah, so an image comes to mind right now, Tom, of like a cartoon picture of Jay Powell juggling. And he has, you know, a bunch of bunch of balls in the air already. He's got, you know, he's got 
monetary policy. He's got liquidity facility ball in the air. He's got a credit facility. He's got a real-time payment ball in the air. He's got bank regulations in the air. He's got you know repo market concerns in the air. And here's David Beckworth on the side trying to throw in another ball, <laughs> a ball called level normal GDP level targeting. So I, I you know I I, I I can appreciate the uh, the added stress that would create in terms of the juggling act he's already doing, the Fed's already doing. But um, yeah, okay, well we'll have to leave it on that that note, and and maybe we'll we'll be pleasantly surprised. But uh, I think you're probably right. We'll have to wait for a later time. Well, our guest today has been Tom Honig. Tom, thanks so much for coming on the show. Sure, glad to, glad to be with you. It's been my, my privilege. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.